Good evening, creeps. Tonight, your mystery playhouse invites you to listen to Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Come on out, Mr. Host. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door. Well, been shopping around for a nice case of murder? Of course you have. And you've come to the right place because the characters on this program simply kill themselves to keep you amused. Why, only the other day we were accused of making murder our business. But we wouldn't do that, friend. Oh, no. Because that would be mixing business with pleasure. And we consider it a pleasure to give some stiff the business. <laughs> and now, friends, tonight's story is a triangle tale concerning a man, a woman, and a murderer. You've heard it said that those who laugh last, laugh best. But we're going to prove that it never pays to get into a laughing contest with a ghost. Because ghosts always get the last laugh. I know he's dead. His body has been in the grave for weeks. Yet, although I tell myself it's impossible, I can hear him laugh. That raucous, mocking sound haunts me. The same laugh I heard for the first time in the courtroom. He had never laughed during all the weeks of the trial. Never even smiled. But this day, when he came before me for sentencing... John Spencer, you have been found guilty of murder in the first degree. You wish to make a statement before sentence is imposed? I killed Hicks. I'm willing to admit it now. But he was no good. He got just what he deserved. And everybody knows it. I'm not a killer. I never committed a crime before. And all I ask now is a chance. John Spencer, the jury took all that into consideration when it recommended life imprisonment. However, I have the power to ignore that recommendation. It is my firm conviction that to allow one man to take the law into his own hands is to encourage others to do likewise. I therefore override the recommendation of the jury and sentence you to be hung by the neck until dead. No. Judge, please. I've got a girl. We were going to be married. All I ask you is to live so I can see her once in a while. You should have thought of that before you committed murder. It's easy for you to tell me what I should have done. But you won't always be on top. Maybe someday you'll be down here where I am. When that happens, I hope they throw the book at you just like you're doing to me. Taylor, remove the prisoner. Won't I be laughing when that happens? Wherever I am, I'll be laughing bit to buzz. <laughs> Same old story. Prisoner pleads innocence or guilty with good cause. Asks mercy. When clemency is refused, condemned man curses judge and hopes that judge will someday find himself in a similar plight. Spencer's outburst failed to move me in the slightest. I'd heard it many times before. I went home to forget about the Spencer case. Yes, dear. I'll come in as soon as I've freshened up. Come right now. I've been waiting here all day. Surely it's not too much to ask to just... All right, all right, Laura. I'm coming. Richard, I want you to meet my new nurse, Margaret Cummings. This is Judge Thornton that's coming. How do you do? Miss Cummings, haven't we met before? Well, that's hardly likely. It's probably my face. It's so ordinary. On the contrary, Miss Cummings. 
I should say your face is rather unusual. Richard, suppose you stop that silly chatter about faces and talk to Miss Cummings about her duty. Very well. Come into my study, Miss Cummings. We can talk better there. Now, sit down, please. There's not much to say, really. In the first place, my wife's heart condition isn't really dangerous. Yes, I gathered that from Dr. Fletcher. Oh, he told you about my wife, eh? Oh, yes. yes. Uh, you're a professional person, nurse, and I believe in frankness. It makes things easier. My wife is 11 years my senior, getting on past middle age. She uh, is a bit worried. Not that I give her any grounds for it. Jealous. You understand? Perfectly. She's not an easy person to get along with. You'll have to humor her. I'll do my best. And, uh, Miss Cummings? Yes? I was just wondering where it was that I saw you before. It escapes me. You know, Miss Cummings, your face is rather haunting. That was how it began. We played a game during those first few weeks. I would ask... Miss Cummings, where was it that I first saw you? Don't you remember yet? No, I don't. Well, I do. And someday, if you're nice, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we would laugh together. Having the girl in the house made me feel young again. But it didn't last. It ended one evening in Laura's room. Richard. Yes, dear. Put down that newspaper. I want to talk to you. I'm listening. Don't you think you're going a bit too far, Richard? Too far? What do you mean? I mean Miss Cummings. Oh. I won't stand for it. I won't allow you to disgrace me in my own home with a woman who's little more than a son. Oh, Laura, for heaven's sake. I may be a bedridden invalid, but there is a limit. You're jumping to ridiculous conclusions, Laura. Ridiculous, am I? I suppose you'll deny you're in love with Miss Cummings. That you've been carrying on with her right under my nose. Certainly I'll deny it. I've got eyes, Richard. I've seen you two whispering together. I've watched how you look. Oh, you're talking out of nonsense. There's nothing between me and Miss Cummings. Nothing? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Well, then, I'll give you a chance to prove what you say. I don't want Miss Cummings here. Dismiss her. You want me to dismiss her? Yes, Richard. I do. Miss Cummings, I... This is going to be rather unpleasant. You see, my wife... Yes, I know. She wants me to leave. Yes. How did you know? I couldn't help overhearing the conversation. Well, then you also know why she wants you to leave. Yes. But you warned me when I first came here that she was jealous. It's been... very pleasant having you here. Thank you. I'm going to miss you. Uh, Miss Cummings, uh, could I have your home address? Of course. Why do you want it? I hope you won't think me presumptuous, but... Well... Perhaps we might be able to see each other. Would that be wise? No, it wouldn't be wise. But I might as well face it. I couldn't hide it from Laura, and... Now I can't hide it from myself. I love you, Miss Cummings. I heard Spencer's laugh for the first time since the day in the courtroom. I set it down as a picture of the imagination born out of a feeling of guilt due to my disloyalty to Laura. I put it out of my mind. I had other things to think about. The slip of paper with Margaret Cummings' address on it was in my pocket. A dozen times during the next week, I picked the telephone to call her, but something held me back. It was fear, I guess that if I saw her again, I would be taking a final irrevocable step. And then I couldn't stand it any longer without seeing her. I dialed her number. Hello? Is 
that you, Margaret? Yes, who is this? This is Richard. Richard? Judge Thornton. Oh, hello. How are you? It's been so long, I thought you'd forgotten me. There's little chance of that. Could I see you tonight, Margaret? Why, yes, of course. Come over as soon as you like. I dressed carefully. Examining myself in the mirror, I saw a tall man, still on the right side of 50. Still trim in figure and distinguished in appearance. When I got to Margaret's apartment, my heart was beating fast. Like a boy on his first date. Somehow, I don't know quite how it happened. She was in my arms. I was kissing her. Oh, no, we're being foolish. Sit down, darling. Here, beside me. Like this? That's perfect. Margaret, would you marry me? Mary, you can't be serious. I was never more in earnest in my life. Aren't you forgetting a little detail? No, I'm not forgetting about Laura. She has a weak heart. She may die. And if she does... I wouldn't count on it. Your wife takes very good care of herself. She may live to be a hundred. But if she should die, would you marry me? I don't know. It's not fair to ask me now. Not while your wife is still alive. Ask me later. I didn't go to the club, Laura. No? No. I lied to you. I spent the evening with Margaret Cummings. Richard. You were right. I'm in love with her. I never knew what love meant before. I can't live without her. You're it. mad. You don't know what you're saying. I want a divorce, Laura. Divorce? No. I want it immediately. You can't do this to me. Oh, oh my heart. What? Now see what you've done. Laura. Oh, I pills, Richard. Give them to me. Hurry. Hurry, Richard. I knew she was uh, pretending the heart attack. Oh, Richard. Hoping to play on my sympathy. That was Laura's uh, favorite trick. It always worked before. Uh, Not this time. This time I would pretend until I was uh, ready to act. Uh, I gave her the pills, watched her uh, take them and sink back in the pillow. Oh. Thank you, Richard. Feel better now? Yes, dear, much better. I don't know what I'd have done without you here. I would have died. Oh, Richard, say you didn't mean what you said before. Don't you see I couldn't go on living without you? You won't have to, Laura. Then you won't leave me for that girl. I'll take care of you. Here, let me make you more comfortable. Pillow needs rearranging. Yes, it does. Richard, what are you doing? I'm fixing the pillow. I can't. I still. Stop twisting around. This is much different from a heart attack. Laura? She's dead. Dr. Fletcher? Yes? Uh, this is Judge Thornton. Please come quickly, Doctor. My wife has had a... a heart attack. It happened during an argument. Hmm? It was nothing important, Doctor. Just a domestic quarrel. And suddenly she had the attack. I, uh -huh. I gave her the pills, but by that... Well, by that time it was too late. It's too bad. I'd only known that a condition had become so dangerous. Oh, Judge, you've nothing to reproach yourself for. These things happen. Will you take care of the formalities, Doctor? Oh, yes, of course. 
the the death certificate? I'll list the cause as failure of the heart. There was no need to act the part of the stricken husband after Dr. Fletcher left. I stood looking down at Laura's body. She was dead. And Dr. Fletcher's certificate would clear me of any suspicion of murder. I was free. Free to marry Margaret. I walked to Margaret's apartment that night. The street was dark. Empty. I had the uncomfortable feeling that I was being watched. Followed. Then I heard footsteps behind me. I hurried my pace. The man behind me did likewise. Frightened as I was, I decided to stop and confront the follower. He came toward me. His face and figure shadowy in the dark. What do you want? Why are you following me? You ought to know, Judge Thornton. Who are you? Come closer so I can... Spencer. John Spencer. It can't be. You're dead. Dead am I. Well, you ought to know, Judge. (laughs) Now, take it easy, mister. Take it easy. Now, just tell me what happened. I was being followed, officer. So I turned around to see who it was. And did you see who it was? Yes. And that's why I fainted. The man following me was a dead man. He was a... Uh, what's that? The man following me is dead. I know he's dead, officer. I ought to run you in. You're crazy. <laughs> I had intended to tell Margaret that Laura was dead. I meant to ask her to marry me. But the encounter on the street drove those thoughts out of my mind. Arriving at her apartment, I went directly to the window and looked out. And there, across the street, leaning against the wall, I saw John Spencer. Richard, I'm insulted. What? You didn't kiss me. You haven't even said hello. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, dear. But that man across the street... He can't be real. And yet, if he isn't... What man, Richard? Don't you see him? No, there's no one across the street. He was there a moment ago. I turned my head to talk to you and... Now he's gone. Darling, you're trembling. You must be sick. Don't look at me like that. Richard, what's the matter? I... I guess I am sick. I'd better go and have a talk with Dr. Fletcher. Yes, I remember the Spencer case very well, Judge Thornton. You could have spared Spencer's life, but didn't. And now you imagine that he follows you? Yes. But the man is dead. Then it was his ghost that followed me. His ghost I spoke to. His ghost that laughs. There are no ghosts, Judge Thornton. With one exception. The ghosts we carry about inside us. What do you mean? Well, these things you hear and see... These are hallucinations brought on by feelings of guilt. Spencer's been dead for weeks. So the question is, why should you experience guilt feelings at this late date? I don't know. Well, psychiatry has an explanation. Quite often in such cases, one refuses to face the guilt object and transfers his guilt feelings to some other person. What are you driving at? I'm suggesting that your guilt feelings are not caused by the Spencer incident. I'm going to ask you a blunt question. Did you murder your wife? Why, of all the idiots. Just a moment, Judge. Just a moment. I've been rather uneasy about the circumstances of Mrs. Thornton's death. But you yourself diagnosed it as a heart attack. I accepted what you told me that night. A superficial examination of the body did indicate such a conclusion, yes. But your wife's cardiac condition was mild. Now, your guilt feelings lead me to suspect... This murder talk is ridiculous. Were there any signs of struggle? Any marks of violence? Of course not. Mrs. Thornton might have been suffocated. Oh, nonsense. Perhaps. At any rate, I intend to recommend to the coroner that an autopsy be performed. An autopsy? 
Yes, it would determine whether or not death was due to suffocation. And you should have no objection if I am mistaken. You meddling fool. Judge Thornton, put down that paper. You are so clever. Stay away from me. Oh. Oh. I've gone too far now to stop at another. My oh. 